everybody. And I am so excited to be able to share with you our guest for today. She is the one and only Mona Abramasham. Did I say that right? Yeah, you did good. You did good. <laughs> Abramasham, you did good. Ever okay, awesome. All right. Well, I have like, she's just an amazing woman. She is a comedian and I was introduced to her by a great friend and we have really uh, just kind of started on our journey to, uh, together and I'm excited to learn from her today just like I'm sure all of you are. So let's find out a little bit from Mona what her story is because that's why we were connected. I heard her story was amazing and once I got to know her I found out her story was amazing and so share with the audience a little bit about who you are and why you're in the, the on the journey that you're in right now. Yay. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Um, I would say if I were to give you, if I were to really give you that this confessional, if this was a confessional and I was giving you Christy, a, hey, I got to tell you the truth. The truth is this. I'm your classic bullied kid mm -hmm. that turned out when she went back to her high school reunion, that I was actually the bully. So I'm the reformed bully whereby I really got to see that creating laughter as the school bully or the class clown that I was, I was a class clown. Okay. Because I had a lot of stuff going on at home that I was bringing to the table. So there was a lot of stuff going on personally where making other people laugh made me feel really, really good. And sometimes it was at the expense. So that's why I say that that line of comedy and tragedy, I walked my whole life. I was a really, really big kid. And in order to get anybody to like give me attention, I had to be the funny kid. And typically the funny kid and in a lot of circles can actually be the bully. So that's really my talk. My, my, my conversation and my journey was the, the emancipation of your high school class clown. Mm -hmm. And I've taught classes. I can, I'll tell you more about what I do and how I do it. But really, it's a shift in perspective where really laughter is the best medicine. Yeah. Yeah. And you teach this laughter all over the world. I know you've been on some big stages, not only yeah. here in the United States, but like internationally. So yeah, that's why it feels like it's, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's sorry to talk over you. But that's why it feels like it's divinely led because like, Again, I'm a smart aleck, okay? I am I am my own worst bully because imagine if you're the bully in school, who do you think else you're bullying? You're bullying yourself all day. So if I would be like, dude, really bro? Like you're gonna be a, what, you're gonna be a comic? And I, so I bully myself and most comedians do that. Oh, come on, man. That's why a lot of comics don't end up doing much therapy because we're like, do you sound like such a jerk? You're all over, you know, you sound so narcissistic because we tend to be, too smart, but uh, by us bullying ourselves, you it's like this rat race. So as my career was getting better and better, it took me a long, it took me a long time to look back and say, hey Mona, you've done Carnegie Hall in less than a decade, kid. How about you tone it down on all your self-hate? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right? And how many of us are super successful and still like, I can't believe I did, you know, come on, like, come on, we got it. Dude, like, dude, you got a yacht, bro. You got a yacht. How about we tone it down? Thumbs up right. on that. Celebrate that right. little win, that little teeny win, that little teeny boat, you know, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so where did you grow up, Mona? I grew up in Chicago, but, and that means at a very young age, I had a passport. I had a passport by the time I was 13. So my, my parents, again, a Chicago kid from the Northern suburbs, but also city kids. So I grew up by Wrigley. I have a Palestinian father who's immigrant, came in 71. I have an American British mother and my grandmother immigrated after World War II from the United Kingdom. These two in the eighties was like, huh? You, <laughs> what? You married a what? Right. You understand like the Iran Contra, right? Judy, you're out here just marrying terrorist looking Afro guys. But that was back when Arabs were like the hippies back. They're like, dude, man, it's like, it's like, yeah, I mean, there's like terrorism like over there, but like we're, we're Muslim, bro. Like that, that was kind of the vibe my pops was in in the seventies with this big Afro. And my mom's like, he's super cute. So like me understanding my own identity yeah. where 
my grandmother has a British accent and my other grandmother is Palestinian, like literally from the motherland. And I'm their translator because they don't speak the same language, oh even though, boy. right, in, internationally, even if you, you start to understand the world, you understand that the Brits gave away land and made Palestine a thing. So it becomes like I'm ethnically everything right in the world and everything wrong or like I'm yeah. the reason why there's a lot of chaos I mean America globally kind of been kind of a jerk sometimes you know yeah uh, the Brits taught us how to do it right and Palestinians are like hey <laughs> like that <laughs> that's, like, that's why I you add that into the Chicago mix where I'm like hey we have the civil rights movement going on here we have the first black uh, CEO was for the Tootsie Roll Foundation I mean Chicago really is the city of the century and you should know you're from here, right? Yeah, oh, absolutely, absolutely. But I don't have the, the, the you know, ethnic background that you do. So I can imagine your like holidays and when your family's all together, weddings or whatever, I'm sure yes. it's crazy. Yeah, because I had, I had a mom, my mother. So if people get, while my, my one side is Arab, you have to wax, you know, hairy eyebrows. <laughs> my other side really looks like you, Christy. Like that's what my mother looks like. Okay. Yeah. So we celebrated Christmas up until the point where I'm like, Hey pops, like, aren't we Muslim? Shouldn't we be doing the whole like Ramadan thing? And he's like, Oh yeah, we need to do Ramadan. I'm like, Oh man, but now we have to do Christmas, which we downplayed it. I'm like, he, Jesus was our cousin. Why not? Right. It's America. Right. Right. But then we kind of pumped up the whole, uh, fasting Muslim thing. So th that they're sometimes I'm like, okay, what ethnicity am I? And then, especially if you're in Chicago, then you get the Jewish holidays and you have to understand what Kwanzaa is. And, right. you know, it really is a pretty cool global city. Ah, yeah. Well, I, you know, I did some genealogy work in the last year and learned that I'm, I have a lot of English, like pretty much the majority is from in that area, British and really? English. Yeah. A little bit of Irish, but I tend to be very, you know, stuffy, very, you know, reserved. So I would imagine, you know, if that's your mom's nature and then with your dad, and especially if he was more of the hippie guy, like oh, how did they ever like get meet? Together? I don't know. How did they meet? <laughs> yeah. Wondering, what happened? How did the yeah. two of them um, come know. into play? Yeah. Well, the two of them were, my uh, my dad was working at a restaurant, a very, an Arab restaurant. Now, remember now, you, you're seeing hummus all the time. You go to the grocery store, you see chocolate hummus, like a Trader Joe's, you're like, what's up with the cho chocolate right. hummus, right? But back in the day, there wasn't that level of Arab culture and Arab food, in, even in a big city like Chicago. But there was a restaurant and my mom was was living over by Loyola and she had this doorman, this Egyptian doorman that was like, hey lady, do you want to go out some time with me? I love your accent, I love your accent. <laughs> He's like, yeah, no, thanks. And then he kept on her. And, and I'm imagining that he must have looked like me, like, hey, lady, how was the, the, you're doing? You know what I'm saying? So then, then I just, just a heads up, like I'm recording. <laughs> you're walking through her studio, dude. You're <laughs> well, so for, if anybody that's listening and can't see the screen, she's got people walking in her background. <laughs> right through okay. her studio. <laughs> that's okay. That's fine. No worries. It's all good. Can... But yeah, if you turn your house into a comedy club, don't it, you know, and you ask people to like, help. Yeah, it's okay. Makeup. It's all good. Yeah. It's all good. So, so yeah, anyways, let's wrap, up, let's wrap up the story because I want to get into your, your totally, story yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Well, anyway, the, he, she went out on a date to the Arab restaurant. She met, ended up meeting the cook. She liked the food. She came back for the food. And I guess the cook, because my dad was the cook. Oh. The never made it back to that restaurant. Say, so your dad wasn't the doorman, he was a cook. Okay. <laughs> and there, that's how I met. So oh. I've, had, I've had a very international upbringing being a Chicago kid, but I also have lived in the, the United Kingdom. I've lived in Germany and as a high school student, I did my master's thesis work down in Namibia. I've traveled all over, I worked for an airline. So the globe oh. has really been my home with Chicago. Like basically I live at O'Hare. Okay. All right. Hey, you know what? Maybe not so much now, but any other time I'd say that sounds like a great gig. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. So how did you get into comedy? Let's kind of bring that home and, and see how that whole experience of your life brought you to this. Yeah, it was one Christmas day. I had come back from Namibia, finishing my thesis in the late, I was late twenties. And my family said, you need to be a comedian. You're always trying Wait, to Where did us. you come back from? You keep saying that. I just want to- Namibia. I had worked on my, my master's thesis and, okay. and I was working on my master's thesis, came back back to the States. Okay. And, 
and we had a holiday together. And it was a, a basically a come to Jesus meeting with my family saying, listen, you're working so hard to entertain us. You need to be a comedian. I said, I just got my master's. How about we pump the brakes on a new job? Because the way they came at me was like, as if it was like a confessional and I owed them money and how me being a comedian was going to pay them intervention, off. Intervention, right? Is it was yeah, like I felt like totally like an intervention. Yeah, sorry. Okay. And they're like, okay, I'll be a comedian. <laughs> but that was the best journey of my life because I really did a deep dive into intellect because I, the, uh -huh. my first reaction was like, I'm not going to be a comedian. They're dumb. Turns out it's the exact opposite that your, your comedian is your modern day philosopher court jester, celebrity, teacher, reporter. So you have to know a lot about a lot of things. Yeah. Oh, I would imagine. Yeah. Cause you gotta have this, you know, this bank of information in your brain that you can kind of pull out and every whims note, you know, like, you know, it's stand up. It's, you know, you gotta be able to think on your feet and have really good right. data to pull. So, right. All right. right. Well, great. So if you don't mind hanging on just a moment, I know you have some great, uh, what I call ninja tips to share with our audience. Ninja so tips. Hang on a moment and we'll be right back. Thank you. Well, welcome back. So that was so great, Mona. I'm glad that you shared a little bit about your journey and how you got into the place you are now. But I know you have a really strong belief about comedy in our culture today. And more importantly, comedy as it really relates to our health. Yes. Should I tell you? Okay, great. Yes. So the the three the three tips that i would give anybody right now if they're listening to it they take away nothing number one the most important rule in comedy is yes and so whatever you're dealing with lean into it if it feels weird like sorry if you just got into a car accident yes and how is this car accident here to serve me mm. right so whatever's going on in your world, if you allow that the world isn't happening to you, it's happening for you, and you just have to add, these are principles of comedy, and these are principles of self-development. So yes, and. Yes, and. Okay? Especially when like you're faced with a question, and sometimes our first reaction is to say no, or that's too scary, or, you know, but that's sometimes when we really need to say yes, because we need to grow into that. And then yes, and okay, yes, this is, I'm going to say yes. And then I'm going to make it work, right? Make that decision and make that decision right. Right. Yeah. The second would be a perspective exercise. Okay. Which is everything makes sense from the other person's perspective. Yeah. What is that perspective? And how is noticing that gap in difference important? Okay. So for example, for example, when I walk into a comedy club, I walk in early and I evaluate my environment. Where are the waitress staff? What's going on with that? Has the lighting been set up? My environment, what is my environment? What's the state of my affairs? What's everyone, like what's going on with your house? By understanding my environment, I understand how old are they? What color are they? What country are, where am I in? Because I performed everywhere around the world, right? Yeah. Understanding how they interpret me as an American comedian who has an English accent, or, you know, my type of accent, what data are they assuming is true based on me walking on stage? Mm -hmm. And who, well, who am I really? And why is that difference important to navigate? Because if people see me as an Hispanic woman because I have curly hair and big earrings, that means Hispanic women are in their culture. They're, that is something they experience. It makes sense, yeah. right? So I understand how they may see me from my perspective. So when I start talking, I say, hey, I know you're probably thinking I'm Hispanic, but actually, ba 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 ba. They're like, whoa, how did she do that? Yeah. Is she a mind reader? No, it's because a lot of people more than not have been like, hey, you know, they start speaking to me in Spanish. I'm like, oh, I must look <laughs> Hispanic, you know? Right. But I honor that when I'm on stage. So having a perspective, like what's the perspective? How can I shift my perspective so that it's serving me? Yeah. Not that I'm a victim of it would be rule number two in comedy that will change your life. Okay, I love that. And third, it's gonna sound totally counter to number one, but third is the power of no, ah. which I believe my 
my white side, again, I say white, but I really mean my American, English, European female, mm. who, by the way, before coming to the United States was often deemed as witches and fairies, and they got their own trauma too. Yeah. That my, that my white side is often extremely scared to say no. Mm. Our white culture Yes. Because we're industrialists starting in Chicago has this like fear that it will miss something out if we say no or we'll be penalized. My Arab side, this is the thing that comes up in a lot of my work internationally, me being Arab, me being brown, me being able to connect with Latino and black culture and Asian culture where women are very powerful. The final decision is made with women that, that my brown side could really give some unconditional love to my white feminine side, because a lot of white females don't feel safe saying no. And that's why we have a lot of situations. So the workshops that I do and the principles of, hey, watch your mouth, huh? tone it down. That kind of stuff that I say on stage, secretly I'm like, oh my God, I'm so glad that I stood up for myself because <laughs> I really do feel that. Yeah, there's a that's, lot of conflict going on there. <laughs> right, because if I'm a white girl and I'm also a brown girl, right now it's hot. It's real hot because you've got the, you've got the uh, Montagues and the Capulets. You've got the sharks and the jets. Everyone's like, Arr. you know, you've got the, right. The, you've yeah. got the, basically the bears and you've got the, what are they called in Wisconsin? I don't, I can't remember. Oh, the, the Packers. Packers. Yes. <laughs> right. So really being able to be like, Hey, no, like these are my boundaries, man. Like, yeah. You know, really understand. Then you can have, you have control of the mic. You have control of your voice. And that's why when I teach these comedy classes for kids, I teach comedy because if you can navigate society by being able to yes and make fun of yourself, understand how they're seeing you and how you're seeing yourself and able to say no, no one's ever going to mess with your mind and you feel like you're speaking your truth and you're vibrating higher and you're less susceptible to illness, you're yeah. less susceptible. And that's the, the stuff that I do when I'm not working with comedy. I work on a lot of spiritual acupuncture, meditative, and the comedy classes that I teach, like this perspective exercise is taught at the University of Chicago level. This really? is a project that I'm currently in, three-year project where we're teaching physicians the art of stand-up comedy as a modality to navigate society, racism, income disparities, because when a white doctor walks in looking just like you, Christy, with a lab coat, and there is an African-American man that's 80 years old, he is existing in a conversation that tied to civil rights. Yeah. So he's gonna, he might feel some type of way when you walk in, or you might be like, this is a black man, I don't wanna, I don't really don't wanna insult him in any way. Understanding some of the principles of comedy allows that to navigate much more holistically. And that's the project we're working on because then everybody in the room feels their wellness is actually being addressed because mm -hmm. typically there's a lot of exercises where comedy can actually alleviate um, this fear of speaking up and speaking your truth where then you start to get heavier and you start to feel sad and that's when you start to get sick. Yeah. So comedy yeah. can cure COVID baby, comedy <laughs> can cure COVID. <laughs> Let's say it. I love that. I love that. So do you tell me, I mean, you, I know you said you teach classes. You mentioned that. Tell me about some of the ways that you support your clients in if yes. they're looking to go on that, that comedy journey. Cause I know you sent, mentioned earlier that I may be funny. I'm really not that funny. I kind of have like a little sarcastic wit that I have. Um, but I would love to be able to really explore my humorous side. Okay. So many benefits. Well, if the, the, here's the rule. This is this is officially a rule, and this will be the law of Mona and comedy. If anyone debates okay. it, I got good my luck. pen. I'm gonna write it down. All right. <laughs> the the way you can you can really clearly understand who's funny versus who isn't. So don't buy a ticket from someone who has these principles or, or this this thing. If you're if you're funny, absolutely. If you have a pulse, pulse optional. Yep, it's there. <laughs> okay, so you're funny. So typically, where the like when a massage, wherever the tickler spots are, if you're deep tissue massage, you know there's body trauma. Uh -huh. So that their history of laughter is actually a sign of an infection underneath. So if you're addicted to comedy, you're also might be addicted to like avoiding problems. So my thing is when I say to you, Hey, Christy, I, I'll bet you're funny. Why don't you tell me something that just ticked you off today? Tell me it, but tell it to me like I'm talking to you, like some wise guy. Especially if you're from Chicago. 
Oh, you're asking me to come yeah. up with this? Like, Tell me the why? last time you got real pissed at something. Like, if you, oh, the last okay. time you got mad. I, yeah, gosh. Um, I, things don't really get me mad much anymore. But I did have a situation today where like, I've got a bunch of people in my house and got all these interviews scheduled. And my daughter made an appointment to babysit. And that means more kids in the house. And I'm like, no not today so that yeah. totally frustrated me that there was no communication and now it's going to mess up my interview and then be kids bouncing on the ceilings above me right okay so how how when that shows up for you you stop stop that's where the no shows up ah no right then you go back and you look into perspective that perspective exercise all right how is this here to serve me how are how are these people seeing me how do I occur to them? I occur like what? Then that's where you're like, all right, I got this. Yes, and. So this is a perfect, right? Perfect example. Yes. So if I was you, I'm like, hold up everybody. All right, now we've got 75 people in here. I'm gonna start charging membership. All right, just like great America. Everybody get back. Here's a ticket. Mommy's gonna make money if you're in the house. <laughs> Love that. I should have tried that tact <laughs> tactic this morning. I mean, I mean, imagine your kids though, like, oh, mom, she's so crazy, mom. So I think our parent, our kids want to see us play more because they grew up with people that played. Their parents can play. So I would grant onto you officially, thank you for this yeah. interview, but you're officially a comedian because that is a perfect joke. All right, yes, I will create tickets. And the next time that they want to bring a bunch of people in my house, I will be selling them. And then I there could, go. yeah, there we go. That's a big go. <laughs> Um, all right. Well, I know you have a special gift for our audience uh, who listen to this either live or watch the recording um, at some point in the near future. I know you have a time limit on when you're going to be able to share this free gift. But if somebody yes. does yes. want to take a part of this, will you like share what that is, what you're going to Absolutely. Be giving I'd like to offer a 90 minute workshop, which will be I'll, we'll have the information on when that live class is going to be. It's a 90 minute class clowns workshop. And I run this workshop for this. It's the same workshop, whether it's kids in high school for veterans, those with Alzheimer's or in corporate America, where I've been doing a dual development model mm. for corporate training, team building. A lot of these same principles go into the, all that training uh, modality. So offering a 90 minute course. And if you don't, if you can't attend it live, which we really hope you will, because there'll be so much oh, interaction. Absolutely. It's always yes, it's live. so juicy. So, and especially so, so juicy. when there's no excuse because they can all attend from whatever location they're in. We're going to get yeah. people from all over on this class. Yep. And I might have comedian friends coming in and out of the background Ooh. or in and out from different countries. You never know, right? Love that. Okay. Love so yeah, we're going to offer that. And then it'll be also recorded for available for consumption. So we'll, we'll have that recording available. Okay. And the link will be in the show notes below on how you can sign up to get that free class. But I am super excited. I know I'm going to be one of your first signups because I think that that would be super helpful for me to uh, understand my humor. Yay. <laughs> so I can develop it further. Because everybody needs a lot more feminine energy, the divine feminine and the mom. We want to make sure that you are able to, you know, do what you do and do it in a fun, healthy way. And that's where comedy comes in. Absolutely. Yeah. I don't want to be the mean grandma. I want to be the fun grandma. Yeah. You're already the hot grandma. Oh, you got to be the oh, funny yeah. grandma. That's telling <laughs> jokes. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate your time. And thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, I know you are going to be sharing your official story and our next Overcoming Mediocrity book to be released in the early 2021. So I'm so excited to be working with you on that project. Thank you. Um, but have an amazing rest of the day and thank love you. you. Love you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.